Breath of Life presents Experience the Power with Walter L. Pearson, Jr. Join us now as Pastor Pearson continues his message entitled, He's There for You. responsibility for the sins of Israel and all you had to do was to take a lamb because you know what happens the lamb represents Jesus and the blood of the lamb represents Jesus death on Calvary so every day it happened but there came a day called the day of atonement early in the year God would say my my tent, my house is full of your sin. And I can't let my house remain filled with your problems. I've got to put the responsibility for sin where it belongs. I don't know whether you think about it, but you and I are not finally responsible for what we do. When we sin, our error has been to listen to the wrong voice. If you follow Jesus, you're in great shape. In fact, even if your humanity blemishes what you do for Christ, there is mercy for that. That's not the problem. The problem is when fooling ourselves, we say, I'm not going to do what he says. Nobody. In fact, I've heard him say it. No preacher is going to tell me what to do. And I agree with you. You ought not let any preacher tell you what to do. If they don't read it from the Bible, you may safely ignore it. But when I read it from the Word of God, that's a whole different story. Because what God says matters. And you cannot with impunity live your life in rebellion against God. Even your body will become riddled with pain if you continue to live outside of the laws of God you bring death upon yourself so what God said is that there must be a time during the year when we put sin where it belongs and watch what happened when they came down to the day of atonement the high priest alone would go and pull back that veil and go into the most holy place taking an offering that represented all of the accumulated sins that had been put into the tabernacle over the year and he would sprinkle the blood in there then he would come out and they would have made a choice between two goats one would be the Lord's the other one would be Azazel that name represents the name of Satan in that particular symbol so the high priest with all of the sin of Israel for a year on his person would say bring me Azazel and he put his hand on the head of that goat and legally transfer all of the sins of Israel for a year onto the head of that goat representing Satan and a man called the fit man would take Azazel and lead him out and out and out and out until the goat could never find his way back he would wander in the woods until he died and that's where the sins were transmitted they were put on the head of the devil who has brought sin upon us and I don't know about you but I feel pretty good about it because that's where they belong there are times when I'm doing pretty good and the devil comes and interferes don't think the devil won't come to church mmm I don't want to get too personal, but you need to check who you're sitting by. <laughs> huh? Devil's influence is in church. In fact, he probably gets there earlier than most people who claim to be saints. But he's there. But what I learned by looking at the Day of Atonement is this. God shows us in this amazing parallel. And I've got to remind you that what you see in the sanctuary in the wilderness is mirrored in heaven. 
So if there's a table of showbread in the sanctuary, there's one up there. Right. wonder what that bread is like. If there's a candlestick here, there's one up there. What, what does that light look like? If there's an altar of incense here, there's one there. If there is, if there is an ark of the covenant, yeah. All right. if there are those angels yeah. that face each other carved out of gold yeah. on earth, what must it be like in heaven? Right. Well, I, I got, got something to show you. Look at number seven, because these are not carved angels. These angels are alive. Let me show you my number seven. And uh, what I want you to see is this, that in heaven there is everything that is shown. Look, those are not carved angels. And incidentally, the artist made them a certain color. Don't get locked into that. Nobody knows what color these angels are going to be when we see them. But I think it's a great photograph. I think it's a great picture, don't you? But don't be shocked. Don't be shocked if when you see the angels, I just know they're holy. What do you say? <laughs> so, so watch this. In fact, show me number nine. Show me number nine. Uh, I'll look at it on this side. I'm, I'm amazingly equipped here. If you look at this representation, you see the high priest standing at the Ark of the Covenant, and then you see a connection going down from that cloud down to a family on earth. Because here is what I must tell you. Whatever Jesus is doing in heaven is not for himself. He's there for you. I was preaching in a certain country, and in that country they were under the impression that when you pray, you have, to, you have to pray to holy people. You have to pray to saints who have died. And the saint will recommend you perhaps to a relative of Jesus when he lived on earth. And then that, maybe the mother of Jesus on earth, maybe she could get your prayer to Jesus. Do you know that when Jesus is standing in that sanctuary up there, I don't need anybody to get me through? When I think about it, when I get on my knees at home, my home may not be the place I'd prefer to live, but there must be a place in my house where I can pour out my heart to the high priest who ministers tonight in the heavenly sanctuary. And every time I pray, he hears my prayer. Well, I don't know. We need to talk about what happens in that place. Go to the book of Hebrews. Because uh, I'm telling you, this, this is powerful. This whole sermon is an experience to power moment. Uh, Hebrews. Uh, you know something? Do I need to prove to you that in heaven they got the same thing? Yes, I will. I'll do it with one text. Go to Revelation chapter 15. I'm sorry to interrupt you from Hebrews, but it's not far from Revelation, <laughs> so you can go back. Revelation chapter 15 and verse 5. I don't really think I need it, but some doubter may be there. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 15 and verse 5, and, and after that I looked and beheld, behold the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. Yeah. If you look there, you see the tabernacle of the testimony. If you look in Revelation 11:19, 19, the ark of his testament is there. If you look in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 3, the altar of incense is there. Right. Whatever was here is only a reflection of what's in heaven. So now let's talk about what happens in heaven. And now you're in Hebrews. Some of you never left it. You were wise. 
you were wise. Uh, Hebrews 9. Let's go there because you know something? I've learned that I can just read and, and run into powerful moments. So you forgive me if I pause and experience the power because it's all in here. This is Hebrews chapter 9. And I'm going to try to read straight through. I really don't want to interrupt you. But from time to time, I can't help myself. The power multiplies itself exponentially. And I feel things that I cannot resist. Do you forgive me? Thank you. This is Hebrews chapter 9. Start verse 11. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Watch this next one. I'm going to try to read it and not get excited. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Ah, oh, that's a powerful moment. I declare it and experience the power moment. What God says is this. If that sanctuary on earth worked, if sprinkling blood of calves and bulls and goats, if that worked, if, if anything happened because of that reflection of what happens in heaven, then what do you think happens when Jesus arrives in the heavenly sanctuary with the blood that he shed on Calvary's cross? Ah! What do you think happened if the blood of an animal reflecting what Jesus does can make a change? What happens when Jesus comes? And I guess some person like me would say, uh, Lord, where, where is the blood? Do we have any blood? Don't you remember? Don't you remember where I was before I came here? Don't you remember that they hung me on a cross? I'm not going to steal my, my sermon for Sabbath. <laughs> Tempted to, but I'm not going to do it. Don't you remember that I just let them take what they had no power to take? Do you know Jesus didn't have to stay on that cross? Listen, listen. Jesus made the promise to die for me as God. He had to keep it as man. And he was not a play man. Right. This was not some cinematographer. Yeah. God said, I will. Yeah. God said, when they sin, and I know they will, I love them so much that I'll put on human flesh. I'll reduce myself to seven to nine, nine pounds of human flesh and be born of a virgin. I'll be born with no extraordinary protection that every child of God cannot have. Don't give me anything special. Treat me like a man. I want to become a man. I want to walk where the first Adam walked. I want to go in that path where he could not walk straight. I want to walk with the power that anybody can have if they just call on my father. So, Father, don't give me anything special. Don't make any special arrangements for me. Just give me what you would give Pearson, and then let me walk. So he comes to the most holy place, my high priest, and he does not come with the blood of animals. He comes with that blood that has just flowed from his own veins. And let's, let's read some more. I'm sorry, I got carried away. Right. Hebrews chapter 9, I went, did I go to 14? Uh, let me start with 23. 
Hebrews 9, start with 23. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are figures of the truth, but now into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Yes. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth to the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin, to put away sin, yes. to put away sin, yes. to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself oh that's powerful he went into heaven itself to appear before God for us can, can we talk do you know that man can't face God remember after Moses had been up in the mount all those weeks he had enough temerity to say, let me see you. <laughs> I don't blame him. There are times when I want to see Jesus. But I don't want him to show up in bodily form. Because the righteousness of God cannot be withstood by unrighteous man. So, so, so Moses said, Lord, let me see you. He said, you can't see me and live. Because my righteousness is too much for you. I, I'm going to read this for you one time, not, not long from now. When Christ comes, people who have not repented will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. You're not going to have to do anything. You've just been living in darkness so long that when you see his brightness, you're gone. Are you listening to me? So, so what Moses said was, let me see. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. And this is, this is, you forgive me. I got all kinds of experience to power moments tonight, don't I? Jesus expressed himself in anthropomorphic terms. Hey, I checked a couple words. And he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to go over there and get in that hole in that rock. I'm going to put my hand over you. And then I'm going to walk by you. And when I get past you, look at my back. Because that's all you can stand. And even then, when Moses came down from the mount, after having seen the back of the Lord, his face glowed so bright that they made him put a veil over his face just by looking at the back of the Lord. So I can't get back to God. Isaiah chapter 59 says, your sins have separated you from your God. My problem is I want to go back. I want to go back to God. I want to undo what Adam did, but I can't go. So this text says that Jesus, my big brother, and he's my big brother because he put on human flesh. He chose to pitch his tent beside my tent. He chose to take on humanity and then he went to the heavenly sanctuary to appear in the presence of God Almighty for me you see it well I gotta go I can't stay there but let me show you this Christ did not go in fact I, I need to see it you need to show you this uh, look at 19 show me show me 19 it, it's one that will make it very clear uh, I try to make my preaching clear, but uh, sometimes you need visual helps. And we've got one now. Number 19 is the one I need. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the truth, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. So he's there for me. And he's there for you. Let me tell you what happened. Uh, long ago, some, some young scholars got together. And they went and studied 
in the prophecies of the Bible. In fact, turn to the book of Daniel, because this, this is powerful, but I got to share it quickly, because you don't have long to be with me. I wish I could do all those long things. Can't. Turn to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Young people started studying the Bible. And when they studied, they came across some predictions in the Bible. Daniel chapter 7, start with verse 9. Here's what it says. And I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. Can I stop there just for a minute? Okay, I'm ready to go now. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Verse 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand, thousands ministered unto him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. This is the thing that you hate to hear preachers talk about. Don't, I, I get so sick of these preachers talking about judgment. Well, some preacher had better tell you what's in the Word of God, because whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, the Bible says there will come a time known as judgment. And incidentally, judgment is not about you. It's about the vindication of the name of Jesus. It's not to justify you or to put you in trouble. The fact is that your works through Christ are not enough. Pardon me. Your works alone are not enough. The only ones who can be saved are those who have allowed Christ to live his life inside of them. So it's not about you. It's about vindicating the name of Jesus. The devil said that the, that the Lord was vengeful, that he was mean. If you don't do exactly what he says, he'll kill you. He, he said awful things about Jesus. But I'm going to tell you what Jesus can do. He can take any one of our lives and use it as proof that he's not mean. But, but the judgment is coming. Look at, look at Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. These scholars looked at this text. They said, we know what cleansing means. It means judgment is coming. It means that the equivalent of the atonement in the sanctuary on earth is about to happen. Then they went to Daniel chapter 9 and verse 11 and am I getting it right yeah I got it no that's wrong Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25 and here's what they found know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks the streets shall be built again and the wall even in troubles times these scholars looked at biblical predictions and compared them carefully and found that there is a time prediction in the Bible that's connected with the atonement and they didn't make many mistakes they went and found the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem they found many commands but some of them only said rebuild they didn't say restore some of them never had any effect but there was one that had effect it was one made by Artaxerxes it was made in 457 BC these young scholars found the year and said you know something I believe that these days 2300 days represent years if you go back in the Old Testament you'll find many places where days and years are almost interchangeable but if you go to Numbers chapter 14 and verse 34 or Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6 you will find that in prophecy days represent years so these young people started at 457 and went round for 2300 years and found out that something happened in the heavenly sanctuary in 1844 what they found was the beginning of the equivalent of atonement in heaven Jesus our high priest 
moved from the holy place to the most holy place to begin the final phase of cleansing the heavenly sanctuary so that sin will not rise again. And when they found it, some of them thought, ah, we've got it. The only mistake they made was that they thought it meant that Jesus was about to come. In 1844, you can go look in history books. You'll discover that people sold all their property. You'll discover that people went and said, I don't want my stuff. They gave it away. You'll discover that people went and dressed themselves in white robes. I've stood on a little rock called Ascension Rock up in, up in the northeast. And, and I've been there where people said, look, Jesus is coming in 1844. There was a preacher named William Miller who would not believe it. He said, look, you can't date when Jesus is coming. He said, I, you know, not the day or the hour. But these people said, they said, no, we found it. They were at the right year they had the right time the only thing is they didn't have the right event and so there was a time right after that that was called the great disappointment and people were crushed but let me tell you something instead of Jesus coming he simply went into the final phase that the theologians call the investigative judgment and let's make it real simple all it means is this the Lord says behold I come quickly and my reward is with me how can you have your reward unless judgment has taken place? Thanks for watching. Join us next time for more Breath of Life with Pastor Walter L. Pearson, Jr. The Breath of Life television ministry proudly presents a special gift offer this week, The Desire of Ages. The life story of the greatest spiritual leader the world has ever known, Jesus Christ. Desire of Ages goes in depth into events surrounding the life of Jesus, giving you more meaning and a clearer picture of his impact on the world and those who choose to follow him even to this day. In these uncertain times, Desire of Ages gives direction for all who seek it. The book answers hard questions confronting us all. It examines basic spiritual truths, gives hope and encouragement for tomorrow, and brings you face to face with the Savior. Just call our toll-free number, 877-BOL-OFFER. That's 877-265-6333. And ask for your copy of Desire of Ages. The book is yours for a gift of $5 or more. Or you may write to Breath of Life, P.O. Box 97192, Washington, D.C., 20077. The Desire of Ages. It's the greatest story ever told in a whole new light. To order a CD or audio cassette copy of this Breath of Life broadcast, just call our toll-free number, 877-BOL-OFFER. That's 877-265-6333. Or you may write to Breath of Life, P.O. Box 97192, Washington, D.C., 20077. The CD or audio cassette is yours for a gift of $5 or more. If you'd like to purchase a DVD or VHS copy, just let us know. Thank you for watching and supporting Breath of Life.